welcome to our weekly webcast from Royal Museum's Greenwich Ships, Sea and the Stars. Every week we're bringing you stories of creativity and history from the sea and space, all sorts of fascinating things with Royal Museum's, your Royal Museum's Greenwich curators and special guests. Uh, if there's a question that you'd like to be answered or a subject you think we should cover, do please get in touch with us. We're Royal Museum's Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter and we'd love to hear from you, especially on this topic, because this week, we are feeling a little bit rebellious. It might be because it's summer, we're all a bit fed up of lockdown, we need a bit of a, an escape from reality. But um, for Royal Museums Greenwich, very excitingly, the Queen's House, one of the big Royal Museums Greenwich sites, is about to reopen. It's a stunning gallery, but it has often been home to some of Greenwich's um, more radical projects, shall we say. So we're going to be talking today about rebellion and especially the little acts of transgression and rebellion that make us human in, in art, in history, in culture, on ships and in all kinds of places, including around us today. So we have three fabulous guests to go come with it, take us on this journey. Uh, we have the regular Sue Pritchard, who is the Senior Creator of Arts at Royal Museums Greenwich. We have Maya Wassell-Smith, who is a PhD student and an expert on sailor arts and crafts. And we have Carmina Masoliver, Mas who is a poet and spoken word artist. And this week, in a little bit of a change of, um, change of well, it's not really a change of tack, a little change of feel at the start, we're going to start with a performance from Carmina of some of her own work. Here she is. I go for my government mandated walk, become one with nature, discover new ways of being, find contentment between two meters filled with beer and sunshine, skateboards and inlines, take to walking an hour and a half to the riverside to feel the movement of water stir within me, something close to freedom. On my way, graffitied walls read, COVID-19 is a lie, people come on, question marks of doubt, but enough for people to shout in the name of free speech, forming a Venn diagram of people protesting masks and freedom of movement with those who voted to leave the EU. But I am practicing rest as an act of rebellion. And for a time, I find freedom in solitude. Stop chasing potential partners. So instead of being trapped by rules, I embrace a new way of life find it easier to decide which way my feet should walk each day. Though sometimes my soul's itch in anticipation for the change in rules, I begin to sneak in hugs, a small dose of denial that others have in droves. And we take to the roads, take to our knees, raise our fists and our voices, chant I can't breathe in attempt to stop death. I like to think we're all trying our best. And that blatant big groups are just searching for truth. And it's not that they don't care, but it may be that they just can't bear the thought of all this death so close and so real that it might make them actually feel. And feelings can be too much. Feelings are why we clutch to bottles, drugs and bodies. They're why we seek to escape. So when we think about the rules we break or the change we're quick to make once we've been given a taste of normality. It's that there's no such thing as normal when controlled by fear, then told to run wild and free. I begin to take trips to visit family, to visit the sea. We leave early in the morning. Graffiti reads, racism is ugly with signs urging to clean up the beach. People bury body parts in sand and build castles with bucket and spade. Restaurants and bars hope people spend to be saved. I swim between the flags, away from Lido lanes. I let down my mane, imagine myself a mermaid. When I look out to see there's no hierarchy. The water carries all of our bodies. We fight against the waves. And when we leave, our skin tastes of salt water. Sometimes I want to stay until I dissolve like candy floss on the tongue. Sometimes I hope we will survive this and long for that day to come. Thank you very much, Carmina. 
it feels like it's something that you wrote because it it's kind of bottled up is is that how you've been feeling for the for the last few months that this the, all these little things are bubbling to the surface yeah, I think um, like kind of I like describe in the kind of narrative of the poem, I initially, I think I did definitely feel but bottled up straight from the beginning, but um, there was a period where of kind of acceptance, I guess, um, where I was able to kind of reflect and um, kind of find a new enjoyment in, in this kind of difference. Um, I think prior to the lockdown, I was always really busy and probably too busy so kind of I did get to a place where I was really able to enjoy my time um doing the opposite um and then I think as soon as the kind of there's a little bit of change where actually you can do this and you can do that it kind of um even because there's still some restrictions there I think it, yeah it still feels kind of like um yeah something is bottled up there and it's like you're you've got a bit of freedom but not quite all the freedom that you want <laughs> i thought it was very interesting that you you picked up on this idea of rebellion as a way of avoiding looking inwards you can look outwards and rebel against outward things and it stops you having to look at yourself quite so much a little bit and i thought that was really interesting i'd just like to get some reactions from uh, maya and sue sue let's start with you what what did you take away from that um I, I think it's been such a, a, a overused word to say we've had this journey through lockdown. Um, but as restrictions started to ease and as things started to um, revert to a form of normality, I actually did start to, to miss that idea of the silence and that idea of that freedom from having to be involved with things. And I think this is what I was particularly taken with, that, that idea of, of freedom from normality is actually quite liberating. It is that rest. The rest, of, rest as an act of rebellion is something that our society needs a bit more of, I think. Um, Maya, how about you? What did you take away? Um, I think what was really interesting is that contrast between um, you as an individual and as a self and this, the enormity of the pandemic so that it's affecting you in quite a personal way and things which you'd usually have access to as kind of self-care walk in the park become very restricted so things which you know have never been rebellious become rebellious but also that you're trying to situate yourself within this kind of enormous historic moment um, and the way that some people are situating themselves is you know fairly large-scale uh, masks and large-scale rebellion i.e you know not wearing masks or talking about 5g and all of those sorts of things that people are reacting in different ways um, it's very interesting that um, rebellion depends so much on context like you say mm -hmm. is you in isolation you can't pick a thing and say that's definitely rebellion yeah it all depends on the context let's let's move on we'll, go, we'll come back to some of those lockdown topics so let's move on to sue's first object now sue has brought on along something which um if you haven't thought about it very much in the past few years you probably remember as quite um well not yeah just it was just a thing in the background and now that sue has brought it back frankly i think it's terrifying sue what have you brought us <laughs> <laughs> I've brought um, Punch and Judy um, to, to this week's episode uh, and it is I think one of the most horrific um, episodes of my childhood was to go to a birthday party and sit down and I had no idea what was going to happen you know um, behind this booth and suddenly this this monstrosity this this puppet arrived with this awful squeaky voice and I was absolutely terrified, absolutely terrified. And I am still terrified by Punch and Judy. And I think this, this particular image set against this dark backdrop of this grotesque face and these staring eyes with a cast of characters, which includes a ghost, um, Judy, the beadle and, and the policeman. It's, it's, if you don't know the story, you have absolutely no idea what these characters stand for. 
Well, let's go back to the beginning just because, so I, I barely remember Punch and Judy um, in my childhood. And I guess people have had different exposure to it depending on where they lived. So just give us a very brief overview of what Punch and Judy was and, and when, it, when it came and, and when it went. Well, I think it's important to remember that Punch and Judy um, actually came from the continent and it first arrived in this country in 1662. So if you can remember that throughout the interregnum, the Puritans closed theatre. Theatre and performance was immoral. So with the restoration of the monarchy and the merry monarch, Charles II, suddenly entertainers were invited back to this country. And Punch and Judy was basically based on the Commedia dell'arte, the Italian performance. And it was very much a theatre-based performance. So although we now think of it as being a seaside, you know, the, the striped booth that you would be on the sand and it played to, to children. Actually, the theatre performance was very much more directed towards adults. So you'd have this cast of characters, which included Punch's um, mistress, Pretty Polly, but also characters like the hangman. And we never see or very rarely see the hangman today in any Punch and Judy show. Was so it, it was... Children? A was it always for children? Because I associate it with being for children. When you describe this, you know, you've basically got a bloke with a stick and a policeman and a ghost and a hangman. This is not... This is not nice stories for kids, is it? No, no, no. It's very much adult performance. And it was actually a marionette show. So it was actually puppets with strings. And it was very much a um, much more of an oral verbal type um, performance. It's only really 100 years later in the, the sort of mid to late 18th century where theatre performances, they've become much more expensive. Um, it's no longer viable to have um, theatre performance. So they move out onto the street and into the booths. And the puppets change, so you no longer have the stringed marionette, you then start to have glove puppets. And the glove puppets are much easier when you want to manipulate and create these violent scenes. So that's when you see Punch and Judy actually becoming much more physical in their relationship in terms of the, the, the slap stick, which is actually the stick that, that Punch uses. Um, oh, is that, is that where that phrase comes from? I do. So for anyone that, you know, again, if you haven't seen a Punch and Judy show, if you look at on YouTube, they are, it's astonishing to our modern eyes that anybody ever allowed this. But basically a lot of it seems to consist of Mr. Punch hitting various other characters with a big stick. <laughs> but I think it's important to, to, to remember that in terms of audience participation, um, Punch is very much a, a Lord of Misrule. He is this grotesque figure who basically, in a way, presents himself as, as the innocent party. Um, Judy goes off, she leaves him with the baby. He babysits the baby, but misinterprets this and sits on the baby. It's very rare in, in contemporary performance that you see the baby being hit. He'll either sit on the baby or he drops the baby, or he may even feed the baby inadvertently through the sausage making machine. I mean, to oh, anyone who's not come across this, this sounds like the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> and, and so, of course, Judy comes home, realises what he's done, and she, she starts to berate him and, and then takes the stick to him. And this is when you have this fight. And, of course, you know, Judy is, is, dies, and that's when you get various authority figures coming into, into play to, to challenge and try and arrest and take um, Punch to justice and Punch successfully does away with them all. So you're really rooting for this, this kind of every man who is, is you know, put upon by authority, and you're really rooting for him to survive. Um, the ghost himself um, basically takes the, 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 the role of the hangman. So in the traditional um, previous performances, the hangman would arrive to hang um, Punch, but Punch would trick him, and he would end up um, hanging himself, committing suicide. But now you've got the ghost, and the ghost really is the, the, the character where the audience participation, he's, he's behind Punch and the audience is saying, he's behind you. So this idea of audience participation is that we're trying to really see the sympathetic side of Punch and take his side against all of these authority figures. And so is the message here that the, this rebellion, you know, just to link it to our topic today, that he's rebelling against, like society is trying to do things to him and he beats them all away and wins in the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
uh, I don't rec yeah, we cannot recommend doing this with either crocodiles or big sticks, but <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, we're going to come back to Punch and Judy because it does have, does it, it's, I mean, it's all horrid, but it's really interesting from the point of view of human um, thought and civilization. So we will come back to this, but let's move on to uh, rules at sea. So on land, you know, we live in a society that has rules, but out at sea on a ship where you have a confined environment, you need to be much more aware of how you're sharing space. You need rules for where you can go and what you can do and what you have to do. And of course, people living under rules like that are going to rebel. Um, and Maya has an object for us that, that, that shows us some of this. So Maya, let's have a look at the ship's biscuit. Tell us a little bit about this. Sure. Uh, so this ship's biscuit dates from the late 19th century. Um, it's uh, got a, a picture, a small seascape in the middle with the words, give us our day, our daily bread, arranged around the picture. Um, and on the face of it, I'm sure the people at home are saying that this doesn't seem like a particularly rebellious object. Uh, but I think if we dig a little deeper, um, then potentially the subversive aspect of it comes to life. So first of all, we need to think about how unpopular ship's biscuits were, how unpopular kind of naval fare was. So um, sailors' diaries are full of complaints about how terrible the food provision were for the crew uh, and how at sea, uh, fresh food such as fruit and veg or meat quickly ceased to be fresh <laughs> or ran out, uh, other supplies putrefied. Um, ship's biscuits were chosen because they supposedly lasted a long time, uh, but in reality they were rarely edible. Uh, they were very hard. At best they were kind of stale and mouldy or at worst infested with weevils. Um, so thinking again about the biscuit that we're looking at, uh, I think through this act of decoration, the sailor who made this um, biscuit is kind of drawing a contrast or making an interesting comparison between the heavenly provision that's described in the Lord's Prayer, um, the heavenly provision of bread, which is described in the Lord's Prayer, and almost and this you know inedible biscuit provided to him by the navy. There's a bit of sarcasm here. He's also supposed to be thankful for. Um, but then again, if we dig a little bit deeper, the decoration of this biscuit becomes an even more rebellious act because. It's marked with the three-pronged broad arrow, which denotes that it is uh, the property of the Queen as represented by the Royal Navy Supply Board. Um, and because of its connection to royalty and public office to deface or conceal an object marked with the broad arrow, uh, it was actually an imprisonable offence. So <laughs> well, don't steal the biscuits. Is exactly, the or draw on them. Um, so this kind of seemingly quite innocuous painted biscuit snowballs from, you know, a bit of a joke about how terrible the food is to, you know, a protest against how poor naval fare is by defacing royal property. I think there's something really interesting here about um, creativity because I was thinking about, you know, I've spent, lived at sea for months and there is a, even now, you know, no one makes us eat ship's biscuits, but there's a very rigorous routine and I find myself rebelling against that routine and they're little things like I'll skip a meal and have a snack later and they're little things, but it does make such a difference. And it occurred to me that in some sense, that's the only chance of creativity you have. If you have lots of rules, you're supposed to be here at this time, you're on watch now, go up the mast and do this, here are the rules. Rebellion becomes creative almost by default because it's the only thing that you have any control over. And, and so was, was creativity associated with rebellion quite a lot on ships? How did that work? Um, I think it varies. I think one of the interesting things about thinking about creativity at sea is that it offers a sailors a way of um, getting their voices heard. Uh, you know, it, it can be used as a form of protest as it is here. Um, I think now we're potentially a lot more used to the idea that craft and protest have a kind of um, a strong bond. So there are, you know, artists like you know very well known artists like Grace and Perry or Tracy Emin who use crafted forms to communicate these kind of societal or political critiques and um, crafted forms are often used in in protests I'm thinking particularly about the Greenham Common Peace Camp um, but objects like this show that there's actually a, a, a far 
longer history to using that that form of craft um, to challenge and question their status quo but crucially it's a form that's open to everyone you don't need to be a powerful person to kind of um, advocate for yourself if you're doing it through making you probably already have these skills um, at your fingertips well let's so you've sneaked in a sneaky second object here which is the um this picture of the crossing the line ceremony and yeah. creativity creativity isn't the first thing you think of when you see this <laughs> when you see how they've done it there is a lot of creativity in it so just briefly tell us what crossing the line ceremonies are and, and what we're looking at here yeah i think from this image it's probably quite difficult to tell what crossing the line is um you know like the event it depicts it's a fairly chaotic image um a bit busy and a bit all over the place um but crossing the line was a, a an initiation ceremony performed or is an initiation uh, ceremony that's performed on european and american ships at the equator it still exists in different forms but um my research centers around 18th and 19th century example so that's you know what I'll be talking about today um, the ceremony was conducted by the sea god Neptune <laughs> and his wife Amphitrite and they can be seen um, on the left of the image uh, now I'm terrible at my left and left and right they on the right of the image. on the right of the image so he's sitting on a on a, a barrel covered in tattoos Amphitrite behind him you know I think considering we've just talked about Punch and Judy it's interesting to think about portrayals of uh, violence against women and maybe we can return to that in the conversation um, well, the but a lot of the creativity here comes in in how they make things so so it's not yeah. that people necessarily went to see you know they didn't go down the shop and buy the Neptune costume all these things for these ceremonies are sort of made at sea you kind of and I should say I have never I've never crossed the line in a ship <laughs> But I'm, this, does, this is not the way it happens today. In the past, people got yeah. dunked and covered in things and it wasn't very pleasant. But they sort of made it, it was a bit like a kid's playing in a den. Do you know, in the sense that they made things, right? They made a hat out of a blanket and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, they made, you know, they showed fantastic ingenuity in how they reused objects. So as you can see, the barrel there, you know, they made these fantastic wigs out of uh, rope scraps and kind of textured them with um, leftover porridge. They used, you know, the, the kind of materials that were lying around, things like blankets and discarded clothes for robes. I've read one account where they embroidered this blanket to make it look like fine fur, um, as you'd see on the coronation robes. Um, so the camera is kind of hovering over one of the barbers who is part of the royal court. Um, and he looks like he's just wearing a scrap of fabric as an apron, but he's holding the razor, which is a uh, part of the kind of initiation aspect of the ceremony. Um, and that was made from uh, the barrel, uh, the, a ring from a barrel, um, kind of cut down this kind of huge comically large razor. Um, but in other cases, Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, the, the interesting thing about these ceremonies is that they're sort of, um, they're almost sanctioned rebellion. <laughs> yeah. Because, aren't they? There's like this, this day, you know, there's all these rules, there's all this stuff that you have to do. And then this day comes and people would look, whatever horrible things were going to happen, at least they got to muck around and do something different. And it, but it was accepted. It was like rebellion, it was planned rebellion almost. Yeah, very much so. I mean, there's only a few examples um, very early on in the ceremony's history where, uh, organizations tried to um, ban the ceremony so the Dutch East India Company does for a bit but apart from that officers and captains like largely don't object to it um, although you, sometimes they do but they usually change their mind or kind of uh, there's there's a certain amount of mob rule in, in getting the ceremony to go ahead um, and there are some scholars who suggested that uh, in cases like this kind of the rebellion and the transgression as long as it's focused in one particular point in time it creates the order of the rest of the time you know you have uh, a large blowout and then it you know you get it all out of your system so that there's this kind of um uh you know a, a scale and and that it's set and this this kind you of accept it's going uh, to happen and you try yeah. and corral it and that's yeah. so free of it the rest of the time. We, we'll come back to some of these topics because um, it's interesting how this keeps coming up is like rebellion is always there. 
whatever you do, it's always there. It's just a case of how you manage it. So mm. let's move on to um, rebellion of today. And of course, that doesn't just, we associate the word rebellion with things like riots and protests and big events, but words can obviously be just um, as rebellious. And, and we heard from Carmina at the start. And Carmina, perhaps we could start with talking about um, your spoken word rebellion uh, and, and she growls and how you think spoken word plays into rebellion. Um, well, I think that it's spoken words always um, kind of had a kind of um, political roots to it. Um, but I think particularly um, when I, I started She Growls in 2013 and its main um, idea is to just give a platform for women and non-binary people um, and it's meant to be um, just very um, very much about celebrating uh, the people that are on the stage and giving a kind of space um, that maybe those people don't have in other contexts um, but it it's it's been interesting there's only been kind of a couple of of remarks in the past where people have kind of questioned it but I think just because um, I don't know it just I, I think when I thought of it I didn't see it as very rebellious um, I think sort of maybe sort of being in in those spoken word spaces it seemed something kind of very natural for me to do and I didn't think that it would be questioned and for the most part it's it's been um, celebrated and people have reacted positively to it um, but yeah, I think it's interesting, the idea of just doing something like that being seen as rebellious. Well, I guess, again, it's, it depends on context, doesn't it? And what's what's going on around you. I was just wondering what you thought about. So I think when still today there's this image of poetry, you know, it's the things you learn at school and they tend to be very formal poems and they tend to be very, they're sort of associated with good behavior and, and proper things. And, and yet we see that poetry is one of the most fertile grounds for rebellion in different ways. And it's kind of, it's, it's interesting that there's these two, these almost two ends of the spectrum. There's the very formal and the very establishment. And then there's the very raw, this is just people expressing themselves. Do you see, do you think that spoken word is a particularly good, you know, way of rebelling? Or, or do you see people using it like that? Or is it just another way of expressing yourself? Um, yeah, I think there's perhaps, um, perhaps that's why, um, I think a lot of people who do spoken word poetry, it's, it's, um, well, for me, I guess, personally, it's, I don't often like to see the distinction between the page and the stage. And I think that it's often kind of people who are from more of a page background that want to kind of keep those distinctions in place and so I think that's interesting in terms of the fact that that spoken word has this um yeah this kind of idea of rebellion behind it that can it ever be accepted into kind of um a more formal context um thinking um, particularly at the moment I'm, I'm writing about um, particularly she growls and other similar events um, about the role of feminism in spoken word uh, for a book um, that I think is going to be titled spoken word in the UK and it's going to be published later this year and it's interesting that this is actually I think probably one of the first times that we're seeing a kind of acceptance of spoken words as something that is also um, an academic subject as well and it has you know its own histories that not um not everyone knows about so i think it's it's really positive to see the a kind of book like this um where people can um learn more about spoken word in the UK today and 
kind of a, a bit of the background to it as well. And yet it's so democratic, isn't it? Because you of all those art forms, you don't need anything. You know, you can be in the middle of a field with nothing and you have access to remembering poems. If you're just joining us, uh, this is Ship, Sea and the Stars, the weekly online webcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. And this week we are talking about the underbelly of rebellion. Uh, we have curator, curator Sue Pritchard, uh, PhD student Maya Wassell-Smith and spoken word artist Kamina, Kamina Mass Oliver talking to us. And we are going to start the second half of the webcast with um, Sue's next object, which is a reading from Dickens. So let's go straight into the reading. In my opinion, the street punch is one of those extravagant reliefs from the realities of life, which would lose its hold upon the people if it were made moral and instructive. I regard it as quite harmless in its influence, and as an outrageous joke which no one in existence would think of regarding as an incentive to any kind of action, or as a model for any kind of conduct. It is possible, I think, the one secret source of pleasure very generally derived from this performance is the satisfaction the spectator feels in the circumstance that likenesses of men and women can be so knocked about without any pain or suffering. So, Sue, there's Dickens saying that basically, don't make a fuss about Punch and Judy. No one thinks it's real. It's all fine. Is he right? Well, I think I set myself a challenge uh, this week because I've chosen two of my least favourite things, Punch and Judy. <laughs> Um, I think as a, as a kind of code, I should say that I think Dickens is saying he is drawing us back to that di idea of the origins of Punch and Judy um, and that idea that it being a theatrical performance. However, that said, I do think for anyone who's been around domestic violence, that idea of everybody understands that it's not real is not true. Um, and I think that um, with Dickens, he's drawing on that idea of because the, the puppets are so grotesque, they don't look like real people. They have these static features, as I say, they're very great grotesque. Punch has this very squeaky voice that's produced using the, 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 the swazzle. That for somehow we all get, we all get it. We all understand that it's not real, it's performance. And at the end of the show, the puppets get up and they perform again. Um, and I do find that really conflicting because I think it is this sense that um, in some ways we accept a level of violence in performance and on television, which is, I think, really problematic. And I think it's particularly become problematic when we hear, you know, various cases that have emerged through lockdown of domestic violence. And when I talk about domestic violence, I mean male and female acts of domestic violence. Well, it's very, um, it's, it's very, it's like gaslighting, isn't it? It's very difficult to, to read that, to, to hear that description from Dickens, because whether he meant it or not, as you say, it's exactly what free we hear from people who deny there's a problem. And, and maybe if you're blind, you know, if you have the privilege of, of not having that problem, you are blind to it. So at the time, you know, when, what's the bigger context here? So we have these Punch and Judy shows lots of people are getting hit with sticks is it a morality tale is there is there an explicit message to wider society or is it just intended as entertainment i think it's intended as entertainment and i think that's the whole point um as i say when i come back to you know it emerges out of the interregnum where theaters were closed that uh, puritans were saying that theater is immoral you then get these performances which turn it all on its head. It's not meant to be moralising. It's meant to be pure entertainment. Um, and as I say, I, I think, you know, it is extremely difficult. It has changed over the years because obviously some characters have disappeared. Um, you no longer have the hangman. You no longer have the devil. Charles Dickens actually writes um, that particular piece in response to a woman who says, I, I don't think this is a performance that should be enjoyed by children. You know, so she is already holding a mirror up to say, should we be, should we be showing this to children? And then, of course, Dickens counteracts it by saying, well, we all know it's not real. It's not meant to be moralising. You know, and I think this is this idea of, you know, we, the intention is that we should side with Punch. We should understand that, you know, Joan is a nag. You know, she's nagging him for, you know, misplacing the baby. You know, the, the, the policeman turns up with a warrant for, 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 for um, Punch's arrest, but he hasn't done anything wrong. 
So it's this constant kind of sense that actually punches the victim here and everybody else is ganging up on him. So do you think it matters? Do you think we should still have Punch and Judy shows? Um, personally, uh, no. I, I find it, you know, as I say, I do find it extremely problematic. Um, I think it was particularly interesting that this is a debate that comes up um, on a regular basis. Um, and yet in 2008, Punch and Judy was voted as one of you know, the great English icons, along with Morris Dancing and you know, Blackpool Tower. Um, I think you know, there is always this argument that but everybody knows it isn't real. Um, but do they? Do they? I think also the way in which you know, it's presented within the context of innocent seaside fun. You know, um, and the fact that Punch's costume has changed over the years as well. So originally he was dressed in white and now he's much more of a, a court jester. So as I say, it comes back to this idea that actually, and from what uh, Mayer has said about, you know, you can transgress within the context of this particular booth, this stripy booth. He's dressed as a jester. It is about performance. And once the performance ends and we go away, then we go back to normality. But personally, I find it really problematic. And I think the other uh, aspect of Punch and Judy, which really um, puts its place in kind of present day society, uh, or makes that particularly problematic, is that so much of the historical context of it is, is lost. Uh, you know, no one now knows what a beadle is. <laughs> you know, the hangman is potentially not there anymore. But there are so many aspects of it. And I think, I under, if I understand correctly, there's a kind of class aspect where he is a lord, you know, uh, he is, you know, highfalutin, and so it's people on the street who are laughing at, you know, these aristocrats, but that's all gone now. And what people are seeing is, is the, the violence, essentially. One of the things that it was making me thinking of, making me think of was the, the kind of, um, the role of history and how I feel that people who would argue for Punch and Judy existing are perhaps being a bit overly sentimental about it um, because of the nostalgia and that actually it kind of reminded me of the recent pulling down of statues and that some people will argue for them being in place because of the history but actually do these things have um, a place in present life and actually is this not the purpose of museums and why you know, museums are so vital is to have the context of these objects um, and, you know, people can, can then learn about it. It's interesting that that would then be termed rebellion. You know, pulling down statues is, is a rebellion, but actually you're potentially doing it for a common good or that's the perception of people who are doing it. Well, I think we can all agree that Mr. Punch can, can stay in the museum. He is, that is a, he is, that those puppets are owned in the museum's collection, the, the, the ones that Sue showed us. So um, they can go there and they can stay there and we can all look at them and discuss them. Um, and perhaps, does anyone, has anyone ever considered Sue actually getting them out to show people what a Punch and Judy show was like? Any, um, they were, like they were in an exhibition uh, beside the seaside um, several years ago. It was before, my, before I joined, joined the museum, but um, they, they haven't been used within the context of a performance. But um, there's also another full set of Punch and Judy um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in the theatre collection. I had no idea. I guess you know, when you think about it, there must be loads around. Okay, so... I we are we are running over time today, even by my standards. So I think what we're going to do is we're we're just going to um, nod very quickly to uh, some last uh, details from Maya and Carmina, and then I've got a question for you all at the end. So Maya, we won't. Um, there's a there's an extract that describes men rebelling on a ship by playing games. Just very briefly. Tell us why playing games on the ship could be a rebellious act. Yeah, so uh, as quick as I can, the extract uh, is from a book of naval anecdotes and it describes what sailors get up to when they are out of sight of the officers 
up in the yards working on the rigging, uh, working on the sails. And what he says they do is that they carve draft boards into the yards, the wooden yards, and play drafts. But also uh, they engage in a lot of graffiti so that the writer gives us this fantastic image of uh, the masts and yards lying around shipyards, broken up. Um, kind of tattooed almost with this sailor's graffiti that they did when they were uh, out of sight and, and kind of a bit bored on watch potentially. So um, they were sent up the mast to keep watch. Yeah. But their yeah, superiors couldn't see them up there. So yeah, they could carve yeah, so. games boards into the, the, the structure of the ship. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there were other kind of um, duties that they may have been performing. They may have been working, as I said, on the rigging or sails. But yeah, it, it's crucial that they're not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Our Man of War's men are peculiarly expert at cribbage and draughts, but particularly the latter. Nor are they to be prevented from following this species of amusement by the strict regulations of the service on this head. When in the tops, however, the men are more screened from the observations of their officers and follow their favourite amusement at less risk, that a Taza expert draftsman, in more sense than one, may soon be perceived by referring to the tops of old men of war lying about the different dockyards, on which not only will be found woodcuts of cribbage and draft boards, but drafts of the go along in chase, mermaids, flying Dutchmen, jack and bet footing it in pas de deux, foul anchors, flying fish, and the saucy temeraire at Trafligar. I love the optimism of anyone who is even trying to play drafts on the mast of a sailing ship. <laughs> yeah. Just how, I mean, how you keep the pieces in, that's just the idea that you might even try. I think I, I applaud them for their ambition. I think um, it might mean noughts and crosses. I think there might have been a, a kind of change in vernacular and that noughts and crosses seems like a much easier thing to play, uh, carving into... A ship. When I ironically was in history lessons sometimes, I sometimes played knots and crosses um, <laughs> with my partner. <laughs> um, as I um, normally was very studious, but for some reason I was led astray sometimes. Um, but it also made me think of um, an episode of uh, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, um, where he carves fresh into one of the desks and um, he gets in trouble for it but he also points out the kind of double standard that they actually have on display a desk that's inscribed with the first four men who graduated the school and I just found it interesting in terms of how time and the the history between these things these different moments can take on new meaning and so it's kind of interesting to think about all the situation now how you know, in years to come, how we'll look back on it all as well. Because at the moment, there's so much uncertainty, I think. Yeah, and it's interesting that there's a nostalgia for a rebellion of the past. Mm. But even the people who are very strict about the rules now would, would look at something and say, oh, yes, that was done in this period. Um, you know, people, especially people carving their names on trees and, and that sort of thing that people seem to have a seem to be drawn to doing those things i mean you can see if you go to cemeteries you know on the, the gates you can see carvings from hundreds of years ago people don't ever really stop doing these little things um and it is almost a part of being human uh yeah okay we are going to we we're running out of time we are going to um finish just by i've got a question for um all of you and and it's you know, rebellion, it's interesting because a rebellion is often a consequence of, of things we can't control. It's a way of taking control. We're, we're, if you're stuck, a human stuck inside some rules, you're trying to gain back some control by rebelling. Um, so my question to you all is, what act of rebellion have you secretly always wanted to carry out or would you like to carry out if it was possible or would you do now if you had the chance um, and if it's uh anything too terrible maybe don't tell us <laughs> tell us what you'd like to do um so who's who's going to be rebellious first maybe uh maya you can go first yeah i think as a 
as many historians of art are, I kind of regret the fact that I'm not more creative myself. Um, and uh, so I think potentially I'd, I'd like to get involved in some graffiti. Scholars uh, in the 20th century conceptualise graffiti as like a reclamation of public space by the people. And I think that uh, I, f I find that idea quite romantic. And, you know, I think I'd quite like to get involved. OK, so that's your rebellion. Sue, how about you? Oh dear. Um, well, I think I've actually I have enacted a small act of rebellion today because um, I moved just before lockdown and I'm waiting for my bookcases to be built. So all my books are in in boxes and the wallpaper is not mine. And um, one of the things that I was really interested in, in looking at the various kind of lectures and Zoom meetings was how beautifully curated everyone's space is. Um, my space is not beautifully created and so <laughs> I've put, instead of an original work of art or a, a wonderful reproduction of a work of art, I've actually put my Pink Pussycat College of Striptease poster <laughs> off of my room. I hadn't read the word at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's my small act of rebellion. <laughs> that is brilliant. I am all in favour of that. Um, okay, last but not least, Carmina. Um, I think I initially my first thought was something like to rob a bank um but i was sort of thinking of it more i don't know if you've watched the program i think it was called hustle on bbc i think it was um and it was kind of like very kind of professional um um stealing essentially but um usually with a kind of um as well as kind of pocketing things for themselves, also doing good along the way. So I was kind of thinking, yeah, something to do with stealing, but like to redistrib redistribute the wealth in some way um, amongst everyone in the world and um, make things a bit more fair. <laughs> so stealing is craft and then a bit of Robin Hood. Yeah. Added on. <laughs> okay, brilliant. You're all very good rebels. Um, <laughs> I should ask that question more often. Uh, and Sue, I'm going to remember that poster. Okay, <laughs> we have run out of time this week. So we'll be back next week with more stories, more museum objects, uh, more about the space history, uh, sea, and creativity. Do get in touch with us. Uh, we're Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And as I said at the beginning, the fabulous Queen's House is reopening to the public on the 10th of August uh, and that means you can see the stunning art that is in there and of course the Cutty Sark and the Royal Observatory are both open as well so you can see all of them on the same day you do need to book ahead uh, go to rmg.co.uk slash welcome back and it only remains for me to thank our three fabulously rebellious contributors Sue Pritchard, uh, Maya Russell-Smith and Carmina Masolva Thank you to Simon Kane for the readings, to Steve Thompson for the music, James Gill was the producer, and I'm Helen Chesky, and I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>